When regular viewers of this channel think of public transport in Sydney, they probably think about the city's iconic double-deck electric trains, the Sydney Metro, or the modern light rail system. But in this video, we're going to take a look at the other transport mode Sydney is well known for, ferries. While Sydney's ferries are a major tourist attraction, that's not their primary purpose. They're an integral part of the city's transport network and operate over numerous busy routes up and down the harbour, as well as reaching far up the Parramatta River. To help my Melbourne viewers understand, the ferry network operates a lot like a tram network, except the track is wet and has sharks in it. Ferries serve Sydney Harbour in a way that no other transport mode can, as many harbourside suburbs can be accessed much more directly over water than by land. The ferries are operated privately by Transdev, but under the banner of Transport for New South Wales, and are fully integrated with Sydney's Opal ticketing system. Most ferries are painted in this very attractive green and cream livery, which gives a nice uniform appearance and makes them clearly stand out from the multitude of other vessels on the harbour. The fleet consists of several distinct classes of ferry, but in this video I'm going to focus on the largest type, what is, to me, THE Sydney ferry, the freshwater class. The class takes its name from the first of the type built, the MV Freshwater, which isn't named after the freshness of the harbour water, but rather after Freshwater Beach, one of Sydney's northern beaches, which also doesn't contain any fresh water. Built about 120 kilometres north of Sydney in the city of Newcastle, Freshwater was launched in 1982, with two more vessels of the same design delivered over the next two years, and also named after northern beaches, Queenscliff and Narrabeen. Four years later, a fourth and final member of the class was built, the MV Collaroy. The four freshwaters were specifically built for the route between Sydney's main ferry hub at Circular Quay and the suburb of Manly, what we now know as Ferry Route F1. While most of Sydney's ferry routes are characterised by small vessels, making multiple stops at little wayside wharves, the Manly Ferry is a much more major operation, and a serious commuter route. It's also the only part of the network which crosses in front of the harbour heads, often exposing ferries to significant swells direct from the Pacific Ocean. In fact, riding the Manly Ferry in rough weather is a bit of an extreme sport, and there are lots of people who intentionally head out there on stormy days for a bit of public transport thrill-seeking. It certainly gets a lot rougher than what I filmed here, and I'll post some links to some really wild footage from some more hardened ferry enthusiasts down below. The freshwaters really are high-capacity commuter vehicles, capable of carrying about 1,100 passengers, which is similar to a normal peak load on an eight-car suburban train. The last ferry built, Collaroy, has a number of design variations from the other three, including being equipped with underwater stabilisers, allowing it to operate out on the open ocean. For a short period in the late 80s and early 90s, Collaroy was used on weekend trips up to the Hawkesbury River. However, despite the stabilisers, there was apparently a lot of seasickness amongst passengers on the ocean sections. Something you've probably already noticed, and that very much appeals to me as a railway enthusiast, is that the freshwaters are double-ended, with an almost symmetrical design, operating just as well in either direction. This not only saves time, removing the need to turn the ferry at each end of the run, but also saves a lot of space in busy places like Circular Quay, where the capacity would be much more restricted if you had large ferries turning around on a regular basis. The ferries are powered by a pair of 3,000 horsepower diesel engines, which can work together or individually to drive one or both of the vessel's two propellers, and steering is handled by a rudder at each end. When the ferry is sailing, only the rear propeller and rudder are used, the blades of the leading propeller rotated to allow water to flow past, and the leading rudder locked in place. As the ferry approaches the wharf, it slows down and switches to a manoeuvring mode, which allows both propellers and both rudders to be used in combination to move in any direction. And it's clearly visible as a passenger when the leading propeller kicks in to bring the ferry to a stop. The current direction of travel can be easily identified from the navigation lights, which change to always display green on the starboard side and red to port, as well as the white mast lights, which display low down on the leading end and high up on the trailing end. Although these are the only double-ended ferries in the current fleet, there is a long history of double-ended ferries in Sydney, including the former Lady Class, which looked a bit like a small freshwater, and many earlier steam ferries, including this surviving example, the South Stain, which operated on the Manly route until 1974. On board, the freshwaters featured dense commuter-style seating, with up to 15 seats across in some places, arranged in a 555 layout. Personally, I don't think I've ever actually sat down inside, as by far the best place to ride these ferries is on the outside, and they have lots of outdoor seating at both ends, as well as along the sides. 
The wharves are designed to handle large passenger loads matching the large capacity of these ferries, and at times it does feel a little bit like being herded onto a livestock ship, but in a good way. There's a loading ramp on both sides of both levels of the ferry, and when crowds are big it's possible to use both levels for loading, although from my experience normally only the lower ramp is used. A major challenge on Sydney Harbour is navigating around other traffic, including all manner of recreational craft, party boats, sailing ships, and these guys. The Freshwater class display this orange diamond shaped symbol called a priority over sail signal, which overrules the normal practice of powered vessels giving way to sail, and it's fairly common to see some pretty close calls with smaller craft. In late 2020, the Conservative state government of the time announced plans to withdraw all four freshwater ferries, replacing them with three brand new Emerald class catamarans. Six Emerald class were already operating on the inner harbour, having entered service a few years earlier, and the plan was to build three more with some specialised modifications for the manly run. While the existing six had been built locally-ish in Tasmania, the three Generation 2 Emeralds for Manly were built in China, and feature wave-piercing hulls in order to better handle the big swells near the heads. The most obvious visual difference from the earlier design are these two handle-shaped things either side of the bow deck. Following Manly Ferry tradition, the three new ferries were again named after Northern Beaches, this time Fairlight, Balmoral, and Clontarf. It was initially suggested that just one freshwater class would remain operational for use on weekends only, and this was later changed to two vessels. The Emerald class have a higher top speed, and are able to make the run to Manly in just 22 minutes, compared to 30 minutes for a freshwater. However, they're also quite a bit smaller, holding just 400 passengers, less than half that of a freshwater. The general idea seemed to be that the quicker running time of the newer ferries would allow more frequent service, compensating for the lower individual capacity. However, it was not to be smooth sailing for the Emerald class. Right from the start, there were concerns about how they handled in rough weather, despite being officially cleared to operate in the same conditions as the freshwaters, and one of the Emeralds suffered some serious damage during testing in high seas in November 2021. These concerns became a little more specific in April 2022, when an internal Transdev memo was leaked to the media, revealing that an Emerald class had become airborne during testing. In September 2022, all three of the Gen 2 Emeralds were withdrawn for inspection after two of them, Fairlight and Clontarf, both experienced steering failures in the space of two days. The public image of these ferries had taken a big hit, and significant community pressure was building to return the freshwater fleet to the route full time, until a more suitable replacement could be found. 2023 was an election year for New South Wales, and the issue of problematic overseas built public transport vehicles, both on rail and water, became a significant election issue. The opposition Labour Party promised to return as many of the four freshwater class to service as possible, and really latched onto the freshwaters as a Sydney icon under threat, which certainly resonated with many voters. It's very unusual to see any politician sticking up for old public transport vehicles, but that's just what they decided to do, along with promising a return to local manufacture for future ferries and suburban trains. Labour won the election by a significant margin, and from mid-2023 the future of the freshwaters was finally starting to feel a lot more secure, with a formal announcement in June that three of the class would be retained for regular week-round service. While the Gen 2 Emeralds eventually settled into regular operations, their engines were suffering from reliability issues, and in early 2024 the process began to replace the three-year-old engines with new German-built ones, something the new Transport Minister Joe Halen took great delight in advertising, kind of ironically given the big push for locally made content. I filmed most of the footage you're watching during a visit in March 2024, when the two currently operational freshwaters, the Freshwater and the Queenscliff, were running in service together, alongside the Gen 2 Emeralds, although I also saw at least one first generation Emerald on a manly run. In the current timetable, the two freshwaters work together to operate an hourly service from 9.50am until 6.50pm, along with the three Emerald class running in between, for an average 15 minute frequency overall. At the time of writing, I'm told work is progressing to return the Narrabeen to service, making up the promised number of three, but Collaroy apparently needs the most work done and is still in storage. Realistically, it may never run again. As I mentioned earlier, Sydney's ferries sort of serve a dual purpose. They form a highly effective public transport network, but are also a tourist attraction, and you can see that reflected in the Manly timetable, with just a 20 minute frequency during the morning peak, but a 15 minute frequency with larger ferries in the prime beach going hours of late morning into afternoon. Every time I visit Sydney, I always try to make a run out to Manly and back in the evening, because if you time your return trip around sunset, you get the best view there is coming back into the city. All viewed from the outside seating on a freshwater, of course. 
If you'd like to go for a ride on a freshwater, Transport for New South Wales has kindly marked which services they run on the F1 timetable, so you don't make the embarrassing mistake of riding a less cool ferry. You can also use the AnyTrip app to see which ferries are currently operating, including which specific ferry is on each run. So it was a pretty close call, but at this stage it looks like at least three of these wonderful ferries will be with us for many years to come. There's a real lesson to be learned here, and we see it on the railways too, that so often the public focus is on having new and fast vehicles running our public transport services, but at the end of the day those things count for nothing if you don't also have capacity, reliability and comfort. Not only that, but the popularity of the freshwater class amongst the public isn't just because they're practical, it's also because their design is iconic. They've grown to become part of the city's identity, almost as much as the coat hanger or the opera house. There's a strong parallel with Melbourne's W-class trams. We keep them around because they're part of what we like about our city, and it's good to see this finally being publicly recognised with the freshwater ferries. Thank you for joining me on this rare video where I hardly mentioned trains at all. If you'd like to see me cover more aspects of Sydney ferries, please let me know in the comments, and now, back to normal programming. <laughs>